question one. Whatever. <coughs> okay, welcome to the Ed Listen podcast. This is episode 36. I am here with Fred. Yes, Fred Carbine. Okay, and I have Chuck Connolly. Hello, BJ. Uh, Chuck is... Uh, uh, what do you do here? Um, my title is Special Education Case Manager here at Fairhaven Union High School, and I specialize in technology integration um, for those students, as well as um, direct instruction in reading, and I also co-teach in the Social Studies Department. I must have a very long acronym. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Don't ask me to repronounce it or pronounce it. Okay. Oops. That's probably not the only acronym either, right? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. All right. Okay. Well, I've. This is. A, I don't think we have too much planned for this one. We were going to be talking with uh, Chuck, who is working with Fred and I at the school in the special ed department. Uh, he does do a lot with technology, and he's. You were on my interview committee, and Fred's. Yes. Yes, we're very, very fortunate. Both of you joined this year. Yeah. I, I'm, I was looking for that wise comment. I could not come up with it. Fred, what? Well, wait. Give Fred a second. Yeah, you got to get me. I got to get warmed up here. Okay. Yeah, he's warming so, up. Yeah. Well, you warm yet? He's warm. Not yet. Here we go. Let's get moving here. So I, I and, and the audience doesn't realize this, but I also I worked in with Chuck briefly in his department as a uh, an instructional assistant um, for how long? Chuck was it? Year? Half? Must have yeah, Almost. about a year and a half. Absolutely. Yeah, we actually did a great project with uh, some of his students where we uh, worked at the marble. Pro um, what's the actual name for that carving studio? Yeah, it's the West Rutland Marble Carving Studio. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, we did a, a sort of a multi-platform uh, project. We had kids uh, go out and um, videotape and interview um, other students who are involved in a stone carving project um, through the through the Stone Carving Center. Um, they work with artists and and folks, uh, professionals in that in that area. And we then came back and put together a video of of their work. All right. We did a nice documentary on them. They they actually presented a bench. Right. It was down in. Downtown for Haven in the Park. Yeah, the the uh, bench came out real nice. It's uh, right in right in the middle of uh, Main Street Park. Mm -hmm. I still nice. remember the day that we were producing that or trying to put that together with the content, Chuck. I, I still hear the chiseling over and over. <laughs> chink, chink, chink. Yeah, uh, my wife uh, my wife loves when I have when I'm editing at home and she oh hears, my God, yeah. she hears the same thing over 50, 60 <laughs> times. <laughs> Shut that yeah. thing off. Yeah. Yeah, but no, that was a that was a real good project, um, and it had kids that were from all over the place. Kids who were um, in the area I work in specifically, and then we had some some real high flyers from the general ed population. And yeah, that was a good project. Yeah, and um, you know, I I think that might have been one of your first introductions, Fred, to working with iPads and Macs. It was, as I recall, yeah. you were you were quite uh, friendly to me because I was kind of a little lost because I was a PC Microsoft guy but uh, I, I, I you know there is a place for 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 the iPad in certain areas of education and this particular one was a good fit for building that documentary and we also did some movie trailers with the kids as I recall right we did uh, yeah we did we used with um, iMovie, right we used iMovie 11 and um, and we did some trailers and yeah that was great that was that yeah. was a fun project it sure was. So now, um, if you hear me say I really like iPads, that's when you have to roll over. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was just I was just sort of smiling to myself when I heard Fred sort of evolving <laughs> in his in his uh, sense of iPads and Apple products. But yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm smirking while I said it, by the way, just because <laughs> I know what he's thinking in the chair next to you. But yeah, no doubt. No, it's a they they really do have their place, and um, I, I think. What puts a bad taste in my mouth, and I threw it right at Fred when he first came on it, is not the educational aspect of it, but the management of it is just right. horrid. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. For 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 the, some of the special ed curriculum, some of that individual device use is is, I think they're more prone to do, to using that, whereas in some other parts of academic departments, it's not such a good fit. 
Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think um, the heavy use of, of graphics and pictures that we use in a, a chunk of our department um, and, and sort of the, the, the seamless or the, the easy operation because there's not as many moving parts, say, for example, on the iPad, um, that, is, that works for a number of our kids um, who like that visual. They like the heavy visual. They like that they don't have to do multiple steps, for example. Um, you know, the iPad is really a, a two- or three-button machine. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that, you know, that works. But I think if you're, if you're a PC person and you've grown up with PCs, um, that is not necessarily your favorite tool to use. And right. I, I can appreciate that. Um, um, one of our understandings, BJ and I, is a part of your department also is really uh, getting involved with universal design for learning. And we were just, you know, we'd like to hear more about that. What does it mean for special education and, and even for general education? Yeah, I'm, universal design, that, that's something that I've been, I've been interested in for a couple of years now. And, and it, comes out of, um, it comes out of Harvard University, and it's, it's two people. It's David Rose and Ann Meyer really started it, um, you know, years ago. And, and what it's about, uh, in a nutshell, if, if I was to describe it in, you know, ten words or less, it, the first part talks about multiple ways of presenting information. So uh, going back to the iPad example, for my kids, you know, some of them struggle with reading, a number of them struggle with writing. So if we can present information to them that it's non-linear and, and non, in a non-textbook fashion, that's a very positive thing for them. If they can see a video, if they can listen to an audio tape, if they can see a... Um, uh, simulation, for example, that is that's a value for us. That's value added, um, and of course, technology flows right with that because you need the tools to be able to to give information in different ways. The other thing that goes with it, real simply, is is the ability to give that information back to your teachers in multiple ways. So it's called multiple ways of expression. Mm -hmm. So again, if I have a digital tool. You know, and this is really what I specialize in with my kids. You know, I want to be able to show them, okay, look, you don't just have to type um, on your desktop or type on your iPad. You do have audio recording apps. You do have uh, video camera apps. You know, you can, you can use these tools if you struggle and it's going to take, you know, you can even use, um, you know, image apps, for example, to describe things. Um, so that again, that's that's value added for them. Uh, oh, and it, go okay. ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. For the value of the audience too, that would be in this field, um, Chuck. Uh, what would be some of the apps and tools that you think are really uh, very helpful or, or valuable? Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, using the iPad as much as we have in the last few years. I mean, I, I think uh, something like a mind making map. Um, you know, the inspiration, kidspiration uh, app version of that. Um, that's very that's very valuable for for kids who struggle, say, with writing multiple paragraph essays. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a it's a way for them to present complex information in a in a visual way. Um, certainly, the Dragon Speech, uh, you know, the voice to text is valuable. Um, that's free. That's free on the iPad. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know things like audio recording and and using video cameras um, to catch you know we've we've used them for for recording classes we've used them for recording lectures um, kids can then take that information they can they can manipulate it um, which again that's another set of skills for those kids um, which takes them out of that you know language based realm. Um, I'm not anti uh, reading and writing. Uh, I just need to to share that I'm a I'm a real big believer in reading and writing. I'm just trying to find ways for kids to who who struggle with that to give off information or give information in different ways. The mm -hmm. other thing, the other thing, Fred, going back to our work a couple summers ago, is is this idea of engagement. So so kids in in you know that I work with sometimes they have they struggle with attentional focus. They struggle with the ability to sit uh, for long periods of time, and I, I know you've experienced Oh, that yeah, I've, I've that. experienced that. <laughs> yes, I have. So, and, and I'm sure BJ has as well. Um, so it's, it's valuable for them to have a digital tool to be able to move around. 
and if they need to and, and it also gives them an opportunity to in, to engage with other kids they can they can move from one location to another they can take their tool with them they can be in a small group they can be in a large group they can be by themselves um, so again you know it's it's just sort of changing how kids interact with what they're asked to do so, mm-hmm. so in a nutshell, it's really those three things. Are, are there are there some challenges with uh, classroom management with these with these digital devices? I mean, yeah. that you find that's a that's a great question. Yeah, I I do think I do think you have to really um, two things. I think you have to teach kids that's a new that's a bit of a new game for them. That 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 you know moving around and being able to be responsible and uh, being a good uh, teammate. Um, and being able to collaborate with with other team members, that's a skill set. And I think you have to you have to teach kids sometimes that you know this is how people in the real world work. They they oftentimes work in groups. They oftentimes have a, a task that they're supposed to do. And you know at the end of this, you're going to be judged on how you did with your team, as well as whether you got the the the, the good so to speak and got the project done. So. Um, yeah, I do think that's a as we evolve, Fred, to to use uh, to use a term you've used before. Uh, I mean, I think we have to be cautious and say we just don't throw the iPads into the middle of the room and say, okay, go for it. Um, we have to literally keep an eye on those skills. Well, you mentioned project based. It seems like it's a project based learning environment now in this new landscape of the 21st century learning. But um, along with that, you're probably going to have to do assessment. Um, what are what are some of the things they do while you're implementing all these different strategies, devices, and technologies? That's a that's a really good question, Fred. Um, and I'm I'm glad I told you to ask that ahead of time. <laughs> um, so, um, but but I'll use I'll use Fred. I'll use our example. I and I think you 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 were very close up with this. So I think you can you can you throw in whether it. yeah if you whether you agree with it or not. But mm-hmm. you know one of the things I think the value of the stone carving uh, project was. Was that um, it? It was a. It was a. In my opinion, a compelling project. I mean, it was a project where someone might say, "Oh, you know, I'm not looking up stuff in in uh, online and and writing the definitions. I'm not. Uh, I'm not doing worksheets. I'm not. You know, the 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 compelling piece was you're going to be interviewing real life uh, people. One of them is a curator uh, of a museum in Middlebury. One of them is an artist from South America. Right. One of them is a uh, an expert in um, you know in an art studio. Yes. So I think we we you you t- want to hit some kind of grab. You want to have a compelling grab that connects with kids, and you know whether that's uh, art or music or video. I think that's an important component. The second thing I would say is you really need to make it real life. You have to connect right. um, with your community, and I know you know um, you know West Rutland is an extremely well-known area of not only the state but of the United States in the area of stone production, and I mean, it has a long history there. So we we were consciously connecting with that. We were saying, okay, this this is not just we're not just throwing this out there. You know, we are the slaters here at Fairhaven. Um, long history of slate work, long history of stone work. You know, and then and then the other pieces. I think you know you wanna you wanna give kids, you know, as you as you suggested, Fred. I think you wanna give them a a, a map of of what they need to do, and you wanna you wanna create your teams, and you wanna make sure your teams have, you know, kids, you know, who who are very strong in certain areas, and kids who need support. Um, and, and be conscious of setting up those teams like that. Um, right. And then I think, uh, as we did, Fred, if you remember, we did that sort of exhibition at the end, and we had our little kids got some recognition. Right. Uh, they got their little recognition in the big assembly where they did their uh, their trailers got shown or one of their trailers got shown. Right. Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm well, no, sorry. I also noticed, and, and it, it kind of ties in what you're saying too, it, while we were recognizing all of them, I also noticed that, each individual found a, t- a place and a time to step in front of the group and take charge of their expertise. Right. 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 Allison was the one that was the trailer person that did the movie section. Yeah. Um, then there was another person that was really the primary interviewer to the yep. curator. Uh, then there was, you know, some other people that were doing more filming. 
um, with the iPad um, and trying to capture uh, you know information from the curators as far as the historical because my great grandfather actually worked on the Supreme Court um, pillars uh, wow. at that at that place and I was curious we never got a chance to go inside but one of the rooms that they did that in uh, actually had their names on the walls and things like that so it was it was like a multiple project too like it was a field trip that showed geography history you know um, and a lot of different aspects to it so I, I definitely agree with you it was a worthwhile project um, and that, the project overall too what was it uh, was the HSP that, that was high school prep that's right um, right, so the, could you explain just a little bit about that for the audience sure. too? Jen? Sure, absolutely. Um, high school prep started about four, four or five years ago here at the high school. It was started by Jessica Carolus, who um, was our 504 coordinator, um, real, real go-getter, really, really involved in in sort of programming and and creative ideas. And the program started with maybe 20 or 30 in incoming freshmen. Um, and it's grown now. I think uh, this past summer there were 85 or 80 plus kids who came in. It's a two-week program. It's uh, it's a combination of um, sort of learning learning groups or learning centers. Teachers uh, who do it usually pick a passion passion area that they're interested in. You know, there's usually one of that's about theater, one that's about art. Um, you know, somebody did has done some work around uh, ecology and environmental kinds of things. There's been some things around um, uh, video. So you know the other the other thing is it it gives kids from the sending schools, the five or six sending schools that we have, you know that opportunity to feel comfortable in a new school, bond with their uh, other freshman students. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a pretty decent little program. Yeah, well, BJ is leading the you know the one to one initiative here. Um, I'm basically behind him, charging with a sword. But <laughs> when we <laughs> when we talk about it, there's uh, there's a lot of cloud computing in it, and a lot of things are going online. Um, and I've noticed some changes in your department as well. Um, about uh, uh, the what is it the read is it the read 180 or no? It's the yep. Well, that, that's it, that's part of it. You know, could you could actually could you add a little bit to this because I'm sure BJ could give you a little dialogue too about this because yep. obviously he's no, I'm enjoying just listening. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, one of the first podcasts me... I haven't said a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle, huh? No, I'm just kidding. So, anyways, as far as what we've been doing, I mean, BJ's shown me so many online free tools to do uh, screencasting, like Screencastomatic, Screener, um, Move Note, which is an interview we had uh, with the company last week. Um, so, I mean, obviously, the, this is really starting to change in education. So, I mean, I'd be interested to, and I'm sure the audience would, as far as what's going on in, 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 in special ed with all that. Well, I'm actually going to interrupt for one second. And something I wanted to bring in is that um, a lot of these tools that are have originated in special ed, uh, really, when you bring them to the class, classroom, the average student really can also benefit from this. Absolutely. Um, right. And I remember being, you know, I remember my master's class and reading about UDL and I loved it. And one of the comments that really, really stood out was that these tools that originated in SPED, you brought to the classroom. And then, you know, I know for me, it's like, okay, I wasn't necessarily a SPED student, but, you know, when I listen to my books, I I actually, instead of reading, I do much better listening to them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, one of the one of the best examples, and and that's an excellent point, I think, BJ. One of the one of the examples they talk about a lot in UDL is exactly that point that that UDL really isn't a sped thing. It's not just a sped initiative, you know. And they they use architecture as an example. So when you when you build a a curb cut on a on a sidewalk um, in in Rutland City, that curb cut is is really going to benefit somebody in a wheelchair. But it's also going to benefit all kinds of other folks. You know, it's going to make it easier for somebody who's got some got some knee issues, who's who's not in a wheelchair, or um, it's going to benefit, believe it or not, a kid on a skateboard who is going to love going up and down the the sidewalk off of the road. So UDL is really about what is it that's going to be 
utilized by thus the universal everyone that can also benefit folks who who choose or who need those supports so that that's actually a really good point mm -hmm. so general education is just as benefited from a lot of these tools so. yeah I mean you know you asked about the the uh, the reading and and I think to put it in some kind of context um, where we're where we're tending now to move in in special ed at least um, so I'm told by by my my bosses is we're starting we're starting to look at um, differentiation a lot more and tiering so what when we when we think about reading we have kids who come in all over the place kids who are really really strong readers and kids who are really not very strong so in order to sort of make the playing field a little a little more even you know we've created some programs uh, and some classes not really programmatic but classes in which we assess kids at the beginning of the year and then we try to fine-tune their reading work um, over the course of a semester and then in and, and then a year so for example Sue Cornell does uh, what's called read 180 um, and then Charlene Cooper and I do system 44 and those those are two different programs both from scholastic mm -hmm. um, and they're and they're designed to they do a lot of assessment work um, using the computer, using the servers from Scholastic. So kids are working on skills. Um, they might be decoding, for example, or they might be doing fluency. They might be reading a passage into a computer. They might be having to spell words. They might be having to say or speak words. The cool thing now for, for us is the computers out on the servers are com they're taking all of that information that is being done by the student individually mm. um, on their own at their own pace on their own time um, in class obviously and it's able to adjust make adjustments in the program based wow. on what based on their individual answers so they may see something that they've gotten wrong they may see it five six times Mm -hmm. you know and just work 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 on it and and I'll be honest with you I've been doing technology for a while but that kind of sort of algorithmic kind of change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it sees what you're saying and doing and then it adjusts mm -hmm. that's pretty cool yes. that, that, that's pretty new for us and so um, it fits into our overall picture because it again it extends us outside of just special ed um, the program that Sue does, it's called Read 180. Those aren't special ed students. Those are kids who are, they call we call those kids Tier 2, which are kids who just need a little bit of support um, in comprehension. They don't need phonics work. They don't need spelling or decoding work, but that's what they need. So, you know, the idea is that they get what they need, and then they exit, they exit the program, and they move on. So... How do you think it's improved the engagement? I, I know it's different when I go in there compared to a year and a half ago. Yeah. When you would be doing a class. Um, with the know. with the reading. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good that's a good point. I, you know, I've it's pretty new for me, but I've been impressed because it's sort of like this intelligent design kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um. Again, you know, making adjustments on the fly like that, I've not been involved in anything like that. I mean, right. it's a costly, it's very expensive. It's right. not cheap. Um, but uh, I think the goal is that, you know, kids, we, start, we sort of started in backward form. You know, we've started up here at the high school. Uh, I think the belief is, is we really want to catch these kids in the early elementary grades and then, you know, sort of catch them up there. Mm -hmm. Before they get to the high school, so um, yeah, that's that's sort of that's been our um, our, our sort of our our big uh, our big ticket item this year. Well, yeah, and I would agree because a lot of the older technology you're using were you know in-house server-based programs. But what I've noticed when I come in sometimes mm -hmm. to to do anything uh, for you, it it. it it just I notice that the kids are engaged. They're pronouncing very loudly the words. They're they're very into it. You know, yeah. it's just, and, it, and it's really just weird because you're kind of you're guiding the class, but you know you're not the you're not the person in the in the front of the class being the expert anymore. You're more of the facilitator, yep. uh, guiding them as they get more enthused and and, and encouraging them, as I recall. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice balance, I, and I think um, again, you know, as we think about um, 
the connection between special ed and general ed, you know, if, if I'm a student and, and I'm engaging, and that's part of, that's say half of my class now, I'm, I'm engaging on my own um, at my skill level um, at something that I can do um, and I'm gaining from it and learning from it, you know, I would think, you know, we also have Math 180 now in, in, um, uh, in the high school. So, uh, and there's going to be another math program that's developing that's going to be similar to the System 44 in reading. Um, you know, if, if those are things that I, I feel good about and I'm good at, and it doesn't matter if I'm special ed or not, I, th I would only think that, you know, these millennials or, whatever, well, they're the pre-millennials now. I don't know what the generation I is called. I don't know either. <laughs> but um, I would think that that's the kind of thing that um, we'd want kids to be able to do. You know sure. what I mean? To sort of access material, figure stuff out, uh, work with tools that are, that are 21st century tools. Um, right. Yeah. So, well, I think... Uh, you made a really good point, Fred, and before, and I, I really can't get my word in here. You guys are just, you know, back to your old days. You <laughs> oh, yeah. To, sorry. I tell you, work together. Uh, yeah. uh, but, you know, I think the role of the teacher is changing. It really, yeah. really is. I mean, it's changing from an expert of information to a guide. And I think mm -hmm. that's a lot about what UDL is. It's a lot about what differentiation is, is all this learning materials out there uh, is presented in different information. But it's now, your the teacher is now the guiding each student's almost individually through this other information for, through these other means, where I think the, traditionally it was always the teacher was the expert and they presented the information in one way. Right, um, and that's a big change. Yeah, I've been I've been hearing that too, BJ. And one of I, one expression I loved was that the the new the new learning environment has gone from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side, mm -hmm. and it seems like that's really the way it is going. And and I, I I have to say that the engagement is is better that in that model than you know like back to my days of sitting with a teacher in front of the chalkboard like Charlie Brown teacher blah 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 you know <laughs> after a while you start to tune out and daydream about a movie you saw yesterday or or uh, or whatever uh, well, but I it just that, seems like yeah go ahead yeah it's changing and I think a lot of it has to do with the ownership of learning right it really is because. You, you start implementing these wa these models, the teacher becomes a guide, and what that does is it forces the student to own the learning that they're doing. It re and I think that's a huge part of this. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, would, I would echo BJ um, uh, from, from the special ed area, and, and again, just because I'm in that area, I think it benefits all students. But when you feel that you own that learning a as a student who maybe has struggled, um, when you're a passive learner sitting there and receiving information and maybe not receiving it as well, I think you it, it creates it creates a mindset of competence. And I think and I think kids want to feel competent. They want to feel and and especially they want to feel competent in the in the area areas that are important to them. And and I think we would agree that you know this technology stuff it's not mm. going to go away. No. And I think kids have an intuitive sense as you as you look at you know every kid in class uh, that I have in, in social studies has a smartphone, every right. single kid, and mm -hmm. you know they they get the fact that this is the future mm -hmm. that that maybe I can get more information on my smartphone in in thirty seconds than listening to a very good lecture by a very good teacher just because it's available, right. you know. And years ago, when we all were, were sitting there, you know, we there it wasn't available. I mean, no. I I can remember days when you'd have to go to the library, believe it or not, to yeah. find stuff. Yeah, the Dewey um, Decimal System, the painful <laughs> searches you got to go through. Yeah, absolutely. And you'd have to go and f grab the magazines off the shelves, and you know, you'd have to go into the into but, whatever those books were that had all the list by topics, and and I and I completely concur with you, but I will say that there is an element lost there too. Um. Just because they're not doing all the necessary hardcore research, because they expect the button they push is going to give them the answer, and I think sometimes they make that mistake a little bit with the technology. Because, well, I read it on Wikipedia, so it has to be true, right? Um, you know, and those are the well, things. I think that it's more of a change of how we think, how we approach research. Right. Normally, right. everything that was written down and published was already pre-vetted. 
right um previously so you knew the resource that you were going to was legitimate just because of that right. now it changes it and you almost have to be the the publisher and the vetter and you have to find multiple right. sources it really does change well, yeah, and I think librarians have to take a tremendous role on that as well as uh, mm -hmm. people in Chuck's position because they're the guides that have to say, is this credible? Yeah, it could be, but good starting point, but maybe we should be going and trying to do this as well because I just think the danger of it is, it, 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 it's a two-edged sword, is just the fact that if they're not told to use the correct tools uh, with the correct procedures or protocols of research, I think they can sometimes make the mistake of saying, well, I saw it on the web, so it has to be true. Right. Um, as particularly with you, I have an exercise of a YouTube video in my multimedia class I teach at CCV. And some are, you know, um, students that just got out of high school. And it shows a BBC production about great things ahead. And, of course, anytime there's a person speaking that's English, it sounds more credible. Mm -hmm. uh, so this person with his English accent is talking about a migratory penguin. And the CGI graphics actually show these penguins going in flight to South America from the North Pole. And it looks very real. I mean, very credible. And I always like to look out to the audience and take a look and watch some of the reactions because some of them actually think, well, that can't be true, but is it true? And when they actually have that kind of quirkiness, that I think is something that, yeah, that definitely the guide of the teachers and things in, and need to be mindful of that, I think. Um, yeah, and I think that's where the teacher's role as a guide yeah. comes into play now because it's they're not the one giving out the information. So they that's need right. to be on top of these students who are looking at this and right. you know, kind of point out, uh, you should double-check those resources because that mm -hmm. doesn't sound correct. I mean, and mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And there's quite a few spoof sites out there that's really nice. I mean, have you run into any of these, uh, Chuck, as far as when you're seeing students go to sites and look for information? Absolutely. Um, you know, as, as you said, Fred, the, the belief that everything on the Internet is real um, and true. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sort of taken by both your points, um, you know, as we think about this sort of um, guide on the side versus um, lecturer up front, I, it, it, I'm tending to think, you know, uh, for my students and, and all students that, um, you know, content, content is important. But some of the skill sets, you know, the 21st century skills that I think are going to, I want my students in special ed to really start to get good at, and, and I need to be able to assess them at, are exactly the skills that, that you and BJ are talking about. In other words, how do I, how do I decide what's valuable information and what isn't? You know, what, how do I assess that? How do I make a decision? You know, how do I, how do I, if I'm given a, a, a something that's a, a critical, um, I need to come up with a critical solution to a problem, mm -hmm. you know, how do, what are the steps that I need to go through to get to the solution that's going to be, that's going to make some sense or some, have some value? And that, again, I think that's a different set of skills than being able to memorize, for example, you know, um, the dates of, of uh, right. battles of the Civil War. Right. I mean, right. It, it just is a whole different skill or set. The, or the Gettysburg Address, right. So, yeah. so you're, what you're hearing you say is you're basically using not only different tools and curriculum strategies, but they're also using different parts of their brain now. Right. Yeah, that's right. that's a good that's a good point. I mean, um, I, I, I don't know. Um, there was a book about four or five years ago by Daniel Pink, um, and Daniel Pink wrote a book. It was called. Uh, it had to deal with right brainers in the future, um, mm -hmm. in the future of of learning. And and Daniel Pink talked about. And I don't know what you guys think about this, but I'm, I'll throw it out to you. Daniel Pink said, you know, we've gotten to a point now where computers have gotten so sophisticated and so streamlined and fine tuned that um, it's you know the the notion that we're going to out logic a computer. Um, the smartest person in the world, um, you know, maybe maybe Boris Spassky, the great uh, the great chess player, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to outthink a computer, and he actually played a computer in chess, and you know, he he played it to a draw. But the words from Spassky were, you know what? It's not going to be long before the computer is going to win every single game uh, of chess. So. Or, knowing, Jeopardy. or Jeopardy. Or Jeopardy. Right. <laughs> Watch then. There it is. Yeah. I was looking for it. <laughs> yeah. So, know, so knowing, you know, that maybe our ability to analyze uh, and, and sort of 
use logic and, and all that deduction, induction, um, can be done by a computer, then I think, you know, for for kids that, that again, and I know you can relate to this, Fred, you know, some of those skills we were talking about earlier, you know, can you become a good teammate? Um, can you contribute to your group? And then how how can we decide uh, what that looks like? You know, can can you present information? Can you give information in specific ways? Can you um, can you create uh, something you know large enough that you can you can show it to a group of people? Um, that that's what Pink seems to talk about. He says mm -hmm. that you know we're 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 past now, uh, you know, and I'm all for engineers and and mm -hmm. and scientists, but. You know, he said, for kids, we have to start to think about, are we preparing them for all of the kinds of things that they need to do on the job, which is, just as I said, all of those skill sets that... I would say that we're, we're preparing them better than we were beforehand. Good. Mm -hmm. um, what I don't think is caught up yet is assessment of this. Right. Because right. It's, it has changed um, how we assess people, because we can't just say, here's the test, answer the questions right. anymore. It's really, uh, here's a scenario and fulfill it. Um, actually, that, I did that today. I took uh, the Google Apps Certified Administrator test today, and instead of, you know, where's this button, where's this button, filling in the blank, they literally gave me four different scenarios in a test setup that I had to go through. Right. And I think that is really where we're going toward, is that these students, um, sped or not, have to be put into real-world situations yep. and come up with a solution. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I mean, I think, I think that's where we're where where we're going to go in sped, and I think um, we need to. I, I think BJ is absolutely right. I think how we haven't really figured out yet how to really assess that mm -hmm. well, right? Um, we know we have to assess it well, and we know we have to really create ways for kids to practice that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the you know, I guess I guess my editorial will be. To gain those skills, we have to start to think about where can they give up other things. You know, sure. where where can they give up? Where in their day is it possible that they can give things up? And I think I I I'll throw this out there. I hope that some of that direct instruction lecture kinds of things. Um, you know, if I'm a kid and I'm in six classes and all of my classes spend a majority of their time with the teacher, right, the uh, person up front giving information all the time, I would question that. And I think, I think that's okay to question that. Uh, as good a teacher as anyone can be, I think we're talking about a different, a different way to learn here, and I think that that's the future. Now we're talking about flipped learning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. but it's going right. right into it. I mean, this is, there are new learning theories and learning strategies out there, and they're out there for a reason. Right. It really is. Mm -hmm. and, well, and go, ahead. Go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask BJ, if you could just describe for me flip learning. I think I get it, but I'm not totally sure. Um, it's basically, well, a lot of people think it's about the videos that you're, do that you're building, because um, the initial concept is you create, you take your le lectures and you digitize them. Well, what it really at the heart of it is about giving more classroom time to the teacher. So by digitizing these big long lectures that you're just spewing information out to the students, you now turn that into a homework assignment or they get it some other way, usually in shorter bursts of information, shorter more focused bursts of information, and then you in the classroom, that's when you bring in the homework, that's when you bring in uh, the students working and what that does is now it allows you as the teacher to s physically see the students learning and to physically see the students working. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm just thinking, I mean, it started off in math, and I think that's still a great, great example in that, you know, I remember being in math teachers, and the math teacher would stand in front of the room and tell me how to do <laughs> advanced division. I'd go, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. He'd give me a homework. Um, and then I would go home and I try and replicate what I learned in class. Well, he, the teacher now has never seen me struggle or work with this and how I learned this. Mm -hmm. I have no other frames of reference other than my own memory and sloppy notes on how to do this. 
and you know it's just hit or miss whether I get it you start flipping that and take that long lecture that I had in class condense it down to a two minute video that I can keep replaying that means I can re-reference it it means that the class time that when I come to class the teacher has time to watch me what I'm doing walk around the room seeing what other students are doing and I think that is one of the tools that I've used and, and love because it really ties into differentiation. Um, I teach a college class and I have students of, it's a graphics class, and I have students of all different levels of graphics. Mm -hmm. And if I stand in the front of the room and spew out information, there are some students who get it instantly and some students who are just, who I need to repeat it for, and it doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. I've been setting up some videos and I send out a video and I had some students who start, who come to class early now and when I looking for that video to hurry up and get it so when I come to the classroom they just tell me okay this little tiny spot and this little tiny spot and it really so the flip classroom is really about giving the teacher more time to be in the classroom to watch learning to differentiate um, and the fact that it's you know you, you digitize you, you make these videos of the lectures is the just the tool you use to get that more time. Right. And, and of course, with all the devices and media they have, too, it's so open to doing this. But I'm going to play devil's advocate with you, BJ, for a second here, only because I have talked to one particular instructor who has tried this model um, and has had some frustration with it. And I would love to have Chuck chime in on this, because is it possible that the model... I, I, mean, I certainly wish I had more of this in my high school years and, and certainly college, uh, and particularly graduate school. I mean, it, it was starting to evolve while I was in graduate school with the flipped classrooms. But um, is the is the model only as good as how you're implementing the model or motivating them to use the model? Um, I would say the model. It, not everybody is. Here's the problem that I've seen with flip learning. Uh, I've seen teachers who it's not a new concept. Mm -hmm. So there are some teachers, especially like in English classes who look at this and say, it, it's garbage. You want me to digitize this stuff? And when you, if you actually sit down and talk to them, a lot of times they're already incorporating a lot of the same work. Um, so I, I was talking to an English teacher about this, and she's like, I can't imply this. I, I make the students go home and read, and then I come to class, and then we discuss the book. And I look straight first. That's flipping the classroom. Mm -hmm. Because you're offloading just... The, I'm going to say waste of time, mm -hmm. <laughs> not, well, not waste of time, but you know, busy work mm -hmm. uh, for home stuff. And then you're actually discussing and working and viewing the students' learning in class. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there is, I think there is aspects of this that can be brought to every single classroom. Um, I mean, and there is some classroom management with it. Uh, I do think it really, really helps out a lot once you start implementing like a one-to-one -one device so you know you can come into the classroom that the students have access to watch the videos um, in their learning. Uh, I know that's a big, another big complaint is that, you know, well, what if they don't watch it at home? Well, they watch it in class. I mean, that's the way my students do it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I, they actually took it upon themselves to watch the videos before the class <laughs> and right. get as far as they can. So when I walked in that door, they already had half the project done and just could answer the questions. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's it's there. <laughs> what one of the things I, I would just throw out, throw out to both both you guys and 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 chime in here as you would. If Fred certainly can relate to this. I know from from his work in special ed, and he worked he worked in a pretty uh, significantly special needs area. Um, and work with some pretty pretty strongly um, uh, disabled kids, mm -hmm. but what what we're finding now in in special education with with federal law, of course, which is about inclusion and about uh, FERPA, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to give children the the most the least restrictive environment, which generally means putting them in general education classes as much as you can, right? Federal law mm -hmm. that what. And, and we've seen this here at the high school in, in my 10 years here, is that our population of kids who are fairly disabled to significantly disabled, who used to be in, the, in what we used to call the resource room, they're now in general education classes by federal law. 
Um, it, you know, whether you agree with it, whether you disagree with it, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. and, and violation of federal law is really probably not something we, we want to be <laughs> right. uh, accused of. So what that means, if, if and I know you guys are in general education classes all the time, you know, you now have have a gap of, you know, your, your beginning um, understanders to your most, uh, you know, progressive and talented understanders, which is a lot wider than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, when you'd have, you know, a fair to midland group of kids who were roughly, you know, they were tracked, right? Remember tracking? Mm -hmm. Kids were tracked, and you'd have your general track, and you'd have your, you know, your business track, and you'd have your college prep, and you'd have your honors. Well, now you have you have classes where you have the disparity between the high end achieving kids and the lower achieving kids is significant, mm. and I think if if you are going to address that by the same instructional strategies, which mm -hmm. might be what you know best, which is lecture, mm -hmm. um, you're 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 in a situation now that is different than it was ten years ago because. Right. The, the skill set of those kids is so different that sure. you might have kids who are understanding maybe every fifth or sixth word um, whose ability to process uh, language is compromised. Mm -hmm. I actually love the fact that they are now with their peers and they're not by themselves in a, in a resource room. S struggling. Right. Or, or just being isolated, right? Right, right. Um, but I, I agree. I, I think... Now you have a different. Now the game is different, and and you have to think about. Um, I think you can't address that with a lecture format in which you are. You know, everybody is doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. Because right. I I think for that kid who is going to take triple the time in that skill area, you you've you've really created a situation in which two things are going to happen. One, and this is a very common thing in special ed, one, they are going to struggle, mm -hmm. or two, and we all can relate to this, they're going to get more support than they need because the paraeducators who are very well-meaning and very kind and helpful mm -hmm. don't want to see anybody fail, right. so they're going to over-support. Sure. So... But that now you don't have a realistic sense of what that kid knows, no. because the aide has done a really good job of taking the class um, and can pass the class, um, where the student, you know, needed to have a lot different program in the class. Mm -hmm. um, now going back to what I was saying about engagement, they need the engagement piece. They need to have all of that kind of collaboration, working as a team member, helping to solve a task. But you know, you know what I mean. I mean, we have to give up certain stuff there. Um, sure. And I wonder. I also, if, and I also think probably the content you're teaching as well. I mean, because one thing I've seen at the Vermont Fest was elementary school kids learning how to program apps. Wow. I mean, would that be a skill set that would be needed in the future? And 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 the fact that project-based learning and using Google Hangouts and being online with other people from around the world. You know, I work for this company, but we're partnered with this other company that's across the world, and you know, we're developing this. And we, I mean, it's like the skill sets you're going to try to teach. Right. I would say the most challenging things would be for you know, for you and for other teachers is just the content of of you know, I mean, history is is definitely necessary in teaching the Gettysburg Address, but is that going to be critical to them when they have to go out and work in a field where they're working for a project management situation? Right. To develop something. Right. Know? And and I think I think there's the tools that are are available there to not only do the the technology skills, but also I mean we have the ability to pull to help kids pull information from from text. Like I said, I'm I'm not anti reading and writing. I I love to read. I love to write. Um, but there are tools now that that kids can employ um, in the general ed classroom. You know, I think of Kurzweil. I think of I think of things that that work in that way. Um, you know, there's there's programs that help with. I mean, even spell check and and basic word. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually interrupt. We I was having a conversation with one of the English teachers um, here, and it was about you know reading books. Right. It literally was. Both of us l are someone that needs to annotate while we're reading. So, uh, for her, she 
she writes a lot in in the books and you know a lot of underlines and stuff for me. Uh, for me, I need a digital book to be able to do that oh. because I go back and I re and I search, but when I search, I search for my comments. Yeah. Oh. So oh, I remember making that comment, so oh. I'll search for the comments. So that's why, like the Kindle books and things like that, when I was going back from a master's, I had to get everything digitized, so I could digitally annotate these yeah. and. Um, at the end of my, you know, at the end of my reading, when I'm trying to review everything, I then had this one page of all my notes, and I could click on it and go straight to that page if I needed to expand on what I was talking about. Um, right. And and this particular English teacher says, "Yeah, I need the same processing." But for me, I remember. Uh, she said she basically remembered if it was on the left side of the page or on the right side of the page, uh, and it was the top or bottom. So she actually remembered placement, right. which. Then when she went into a Kindle book, she got lost because it wasn't page one, wasn't page you know, or page right. two hundred and fifty three right. wasn't page two hundred and fifty three in the Kindle. Right. Uh, it was a great conversation. Yeah, I imagine because it's also notice. Uh, uh, also, Chuck BJ likes to speed highlight, so it's nice and clean. Because <laughs> if he has to reread something, he'll trace it, so he looks at it, it's reinforced, and he goes on to the next thing, which makes it a lot easier than trying to highlight a book and having the ink run through the pages. But Man, the thing you is, picked up on I do that. Yeah, I of really, course I do. I don't even I do that subconsciously now. Oh, I watch it all the time. It's funny. <laughs> I'm not funny in a bad way. I just that's his way of learning. I think it's yeah. great that technology gives you all those approaches, but I also think the guider has to be careful, like the teacher, because they can be inundated with them. Right. But I also think there's and and there is no such thing anymore about the one size fits all. Read the book in the textbook. Um, so I totally am a big proponent of all that. The only thing that gets me a little concerned, and I go back and forth with it, and I don't know if you do as a teacher, uh, Chuck, is I don't want them to lose those skills permanently. Uh, for what, some what, reason, I feel like I want to have an anti the antiquated, you know, holding a book. Right. Uh, by the way, this is a book. Right. <laughs> I, no. I don't want to come into an era where I'm like 65 and I'm trying to explain what a book is to someone, and some young students like, I don't know what you're talking about. What is a book? Yeah. Uh, hey, what's cursive? Uh, right. What's cursive? Uh, right. You know, um, uh, what's a keyboard? Um, yeah. You know, because it'll all be voice driven or something. Well, it's the kids. The kids who uh, who they use the QWERTY keyboard, right, to text. Right. And they they've forgotten how to capitalize the beginning of a sentence and yep. put a period at the end because it's just. You know, it's just not something they they do. Yeah, you have to you have to go to the next screen to hit the <laughs> the punctuation. Well, I, I, had a, I, I had a student do that for. Yeah, I had a student CCV submitted two papers, even though I told her not. She used lowercase eyes for her referring to herself, and didn't see any problem with it. <laughs> That's kind of those are the things that I get a little leery about. Um, so I mean, do you feel that should we just throw everything out with a traditional education, or how do how do you think we could preserve some elements that still should be maybe a part of this digital curriculum and 21st century learning skills well I, I think I think we're 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 talking about a couple of different things and and you know content is 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 you know what it is that you're you're looking at we've talked a lot about instructional stuff and and how how you how we should think about instructing um, you know I I I use our System 44 and our Read 180 and our Math 180. So we haven't replaced that curriculum. We haven't said, uh, at least in special ed, we haven't said, oh, God, you know, you don't have to learn how to multiply. You don't have to learn how to, you know, uh, use vocabulary to understand text or, or figure out the main idea of a passage. We still are very committed to that. Um, I think we're, we're using these programs, though, to try to differentiate that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we can build the skills. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to con be cons considerate of, you know, instead of us giving answers over supporting, we, we want to really try. We've only got four years at, at the last public school most kids will be in um, to really try to get one last crack at the skill sets of reading. Um, I, I'll be frank. I don't think we do enough reading in, in the classroom, and I know that goes against probably a lot of the things I just said. Um, but if we think about that, part of what kids can be doing, besides you know all of the other skills we've talked about, you know, I think reading is not is not something we should forget, Fred. I agree with you. I think kids should be reading more. 
Um, I, I and, and again, I go back to the direct instruction lecture. I mean, uh, I mean, do we? Yeah, need... actually, I have some input on this yeah, one too. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get you to stop talking. Yes, yeah, that, that's hard. Well, because what I think has happened though is um, writing and the skills that you're talking about, Fred, have adapted, and I don't think we have to lose it. But I don't think teaching has adapted with the type of writing that students do. And your example of you know on the student writing on their mobile app, my mobile phone, and not capturing their eyes is I think is a great example of well we've never taught the students to write this way. Um, one of the assignments that I'd love to try and do is you know when I was in school and in college it's always about getting you know how many page papers. You know, it was about long form writing. You can't go to a job application now and do any type of long form writing. You have 300 characters. You have 240 characters. You have 140 characters. You have to, you have a very limited. It's turned to a very limited writing, and I don't think anybody's. I don't think many people are still are yet teaching how to write properly in a limited character set. That's a good point. Um, I've spent hours just trying to f write the best that I can, you know, job applications or great grant applications, trying to figure out how I can win a $100,000 grant and I have 300 words to do it in. Right. I mean, at that point, punctuation becomes incredibly important. It's not about fluffing it up. It's about really being concise. Uh, the synonyms that you use, well, oh shoot, I'm three characters under. Well, I have to go find a synonym for a word that's actually shorter than what it is. Um, that type of uh, writing and stuff like that I think needs to get taught. So I don't think we're losing it, but I do think we need to adapt to what is happening out there, and it's not. I have not seen it. You know, we lost Fred. <laughs> Did you mute yourself, Fred? <laughs> Fred's in the other room, so he all of a sudden uh, is talking, or he must have hit the mute button on his on the thing. And now I heard a door. Did you leave, Fred? Um, no, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Oh heck, you can even come in here if you really want. <laughs> he will gladly unmute himself. Up in the top. Click the speaker. Okay, well, go ahead and... Uh, actually, we probably should be finishing up. Brad, come in here. Hey, Fred, just come on in here. Yeah, we'll get Fred in, in, in the studio. He's been outside. <laughs> Dropping off. Hitting mute button. Stupidly. <laughs> okay, well, here, you want to share a mic with him, and I think, I mean, unless there's something else that, uh, Chuck, you'd like to mention, any last little things? No, this has been great. I've uh, I've never been a part of a podcast or uh, even seen one produced, so uh, this has been cool. I appreciate it. Now, we'll have to get you on again. That way I don't have to talk. Especially, <laughs> yeah, that's really cool if that happens. <laughs> uh, no, the thing is, we're hoping also, as you do this with us that you also take this out to your you know realm of professional development and skills so yeah so I think that I think it's absolutely wonderful that you're here for the uh, within the school embracing this and I hope more teachers we actually had our vice principal as well uh, Jason Rasco come in and he was uh, pretty blown away by it but um, I think a lot of people also make teachers might think it's really complex to do all this and it really isn't and it's it's a lot of fun and it, it's very educational for professionals and uh, staff that work in. Yeah, it, it's a little intimidating because I have all the fancy dancy equipment for this, but you can easily do it just with, you know, a plain headset mic um, and just talking. I mean, this is the best part about this is just talking with people and hearing about it. I mean, I learned a lot in this hour. I mean, I think this is the longest conversation we've ever been able to have without interruptions and just talking about education. The, the other thing I, w I would throw out, um, I think it would be, I don't, I don't know if you've had k kids come and, and just sort of show them your setup here. I, I have some kids that I would love to have you just walk them through and have them listen to the mics and hear themselves. 
I think they would be like, oh my god, it's like, how cool is that? Um, so, so maybe we. Yeah, can I want a student out. podcast. UDL in process. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, how teachers learn. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it, it is a bit like a spaceship in here. So, just uh, I'd like to say, <laughs> very, very cool though. Okay, well, I'm going to finish up the show, and uh, it was a great conversation. We'll have you back on, Chuck, sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, thank you very much for listening to the Ed Listen podcast with your host, Bjorn Barrent, Fred Carbine. He's just shaking his head yes. Yes, Fred Carbine <laughs> and Chuck Connolly. Uh, take us out, Captain Kirk, as we're about okay. to leave the starship here. <laughs> Uh, you can definitely follow the uh, podcast by going to www.edlisten.com. Uh, go on Twitter, Facebook, we're all there. Uh, even Chuck's there. Maybe I can get grab his either Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or something posted on the website. I just posted uh, this this on Twitter, my third post. <laughs> Very nice. We're going to make him a Google rock star too. Okay. Uh, again, thank you for listening and next.